Allison Purgel, lead librarian of the Norton Shores branch of the Muskegon Area District Library. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this Read All About It session of Root Talk, where we will be discussing all things newspapers and how to use them for family history research. I'm so glad you could join us. Let's get started. First, let's take a brief look at US newspaper history. Obviously, newspapers were the primary source of communication for our ancestors in these early days before mass communication. First newspapers started publishing in the United States in the early 1700s, although a lot of those early ones didn't survive. But by the 1720s, New York and Philadelphia had gained multiple newspapers. At the end of the Revolutionary War, the US was seeing about 43 different newspapers in existence. In the 1850 census, it documented 2,500 plus newspapers being published all around the country that was in existence then. And by 1880, over 11,000 newspapers were active in the United States. It was often a point of pride that a small community had a local paper. Town boosters encouraged printers to set up shop as newspapers were valued as tools for promoting the town to new potential new residents. Now, why do we want to use newspapers for genealogy? Historical newspapers can often fill a void where there is a gap for vital record keeping or where vital records either weren't saved by a local community or they were accidentally destroyed, like in a fire or a flood or something. So they're a great substitute if you haven't found that original vital record for maybe a birth or a death or a marriage or another important life event. The information provided in a newspaper about a life event is often a little bit more informative than the vital record, depending on the time frame, as newspapers often had space to fill and would add more details, whereas a death record or a birth record has just specific boxes of information to fill out and complete. Newspapers in this time frame, historical newspapers, can provide a snapshot into the lives of our ancestors, letting us know what was happening in their home time and getting a brief feel of what their everyday lives were like. And if we take a quick look at this image I have here of the local news column from the Montague Observer of January 1st, 1890, we get some wonderful pieces, little pieces of information about people in the community. For example, Miss Osmond was going to have a party for New Year's. A young couple got married, so there's a little marriage information right there. Another person entertained her Sunday school class. Another person returned back home to Montague. And apparently, she works at the post office. So she obviously had been away. And then we had a little bit of a weather report. It's just an incredible snapshot of what, would ha what was happening in a microcosm of time when your family members, who you never knew, were living. Now, searching newspapers, and especially historical newspapers, can sometimes feel a little bit intimidating. Like many genealogical resources, there are digitized newspapers available, but the collections that are digitized are really just a drop in the bucket at the moment for the same reasons as any other genealogical source. It's very expensive to scan newspapers and then have server space to host those images. As a result, for those newspapers that are digitized, some may be available for free and some may require a subscription. If the newspaper is digitized, Text searching is often possible, which can really be very time-saving. If a newspaper is microfilmed, there may or there may not be any indexing available, which sometimes means looking through each page of the newspaper. And speaking about looking at each page, readability can be a challenge. Historical newspapers tended to be very text-heavy and used small print fonts, and they're sometimes difficult to read. Microfilming of newspapers also really didn't start until the 1930s. So historical s newspapers from the 1800s may not even have been in the best shape by the time it came for them to be microfilmed anyways. And then many of our digitized newspaper images come from microfilm, and often microfilm that is deteriorating and in poor shape. So it sometimes makes even that digitized image tough to read and tough to have the machine text scanning find the words that you're looking for. Despite all this, don't let the, any of that news put you off newspaper searching. It really is invaluable. The good news is this Root Talk session is going to focus a little bit on exactly what you can find in newspapers to fill in gaps, to push through brick walls, and enrich your personal knowledge of your ancestors, as well as providing some resources and tips. Let's take a look at our outline for the session today. First, we're going to get started and talk about items to look for in newspapers. A birth announcement, a marriage announcement, obituary, local news and social columns, and advertisements. 
And then we're going to discuss locating and searching newspapers, both in a microfilm or digitized format. So let's get started at the beginning with birth announcements. They're somewhat rare in the 19th century, just because the discussion of childbirth and pregnancy just wasn't considered proper social conversation. So you don't always see that many birth announcements in early newspapers. However, when they are published, they will usually be fairly brief, not providing a great deal of information, maybe one or two lines, maybe a surname, sometimes the gender of the child, sometimes not. And like many other things we're going to notice as we search through historical newspapers, birth announcements are going to be scattered throughout the paper. Historical newspapers were being done by typesetting, where the newspaper offices were setting the print in big blocks and running the papers off that way. And they had to fill in space wherever they had room. If they had a tiny little spot somewhere, it could be in the middle of something else, another article or another section of the paper. They'll throw something in just to fill up the space and, and make sure that there's no wasted space. So they can be, birth announcements can be scattered throughout the paper, so you'll often be looking page by page. Column headings may not even be available or even a little headline might not even be noticed above the birth announcement or be placed above the birth announcement. So it's really important to read through the entire paper thoroughly. And they're often found in the local and social news columns, and we'll talk a little bit about more about those in detail later. Let's look at some examples of some early birth announcements. Here's a listing from the Papa True Northerner paper from November 21st, 1888. And it's in the local news vent column. And if you notice, the second item there is Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Weston rejoice over the advent of a new daughter. So here we have the, the last name, the father's first name, and the fact that they had a baby girl. And of course, we're phrasing it very um, socially correctly as advent of a new daughter. No mention about birth of a baby or anything like that. Now, this is great information for us for genealogical purposes. We have the date of the paper, November 21st, 1888, and the location. So this means if we haven't found a vital original birth record for this new daughter, we have a place to look. We know that we need to look maybe uh, at the county level or the state level for a birth record from this time frame for a baby girl whose father's name is Joseph Weston. So a nice little extra bit of information to help us find other records that we might be missing. And if we haven't located a, a vital record or an actual birth record, this is proof of the birth of a child. Here's another example in a local news column from the Owasso Times from September 12, 1884. And in this one, we have Mr. and Mrs. Will Cooper rejoice over the advent of a pair of twins at their home Sunday, a boy and a girl. So great information here. The family had twins, and they had a boy and a girl. And we know that it was published in the Owasso Times on September 12th. So we need to find a historical calendar and see what was the closest Sunday evening to September 12th to get their birth date. And then we can do some more detailed searching for a vital record if it's, if it's missing. So examples of those really early birth announcements where you're not getting a ton of information, but still what we do get gives us some great clues to keep searching. Now, as we move into the 20th century, especially in the second half, we're going to start seeing birth announcements more often. And we're going to start seeing them still be brief and scattered throughout the paper, though. They're not, going to, they're not still going to be in any one place until really later in the 20th century. And however, they often start being found in women's sections or pages within the newspaper. About the mid 20th century, newspapers started organizing material a little bit more for niche readers, and they started creating things called a woman's section or women's pages where information and news stories that thought that would be appealing to women would be located, and they often put any kind of birth announcements there. Let's take a look at a couple of examples. Here's a list of birth announcements from a 1944 chronicle, and if you see, we have the last name of the family. And then we have the father's first name usually, and we are getting a gender of the child here, and also what hospital they're born at. So that's some good information right there to track down for further vital records or verifying that a birth took place if we don't have that vital record. And then if we jump to a chronicle listing from 1961 for births, we see it doesn't look too much different from the 1944. We have uh, last name of the family, and then the father's name, and the gender of the child, and the address again. So not a big change in what was being published in about from the 40s to the 60s. But if we take a look at uh, a 1980 chronicle listing of newspapers, first of all, we notice that the print style changes a little bit. 
But we also get a little bit more information. We get first names of both parents. We get the father's name and the mother's name, again the address, and we get the gender of the child. Here's an interesting one for the cracker. It's James and Julie, Memphis, Tennessee, former Muskegon residents, a boy. So this is kind of interesting information. If you were researching the cracker family from Muskegon County, but you couldn't find any birth record or birth information about a baby boy that was born in the 1980s, and we can go, well, the baby was born in Memphis, Tennessee. Hmm, that might be where a birth record could be located. So some helpful information there. Now, finally, let's look at a very contemporary birth announcement. This is an announcement from my local hometown paper, the Manistee News Advocate, just a couple of days ago. And first of all, nice full-color photograph of the baby, which is very nice. And then we get the full names of the parents, Samir and Helen Abadir, their location of residence, Waterford, announcing the birth of their baby boy. And then we get the baby's name, Kingston Ty Abadir. And we get a birth date, March 25th, 2021. And we get a location of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Now, we might be wondering, why is a baby boy who was born in Milwaukee and whose parents live in Waterford, why, in Michigan, why is the information about the baby being born in the Manistee paper? Well, the next line comes down. We get some maternal and paternal grandparents' names. And the maternal grandparents live in Manistee. Paternal parents live in Wausau. And then we get siblings' names for baby Kingston. So there we have quite a bit of great family information. And future genealogists will just be loving what they see in these very early on images of birth announcements from the late 21st century. A great deal more information being celebrated. Now, for genealogy purposes, these birth announcements do fill that role of the non-existent vital records, as we mentioned. So it's great that this can fill that gap. And also, conversely, as we mentioned, if we find a birth announcement, it can also give us a time frame and location to search for an original birth record, particularly if we find a birth announcement that we weren't expecting to see, a family member that we weren't aware of. Now let's let move on to a next important life event, marriage announcements. Again, just like birth announcements, somewhat rare in the 19th century, also going to be very brief. Hopefully you get both the brides and grooms' names, but you never know. And uh, what's really important to remember about marriage announcements is you might see an, a marriage announcement in the paper. You might even see a marriage license application list. Maybe a little bit later on in time, the county clerks start uh, publishing that information. And really rare, much more common in the 20th century, you might see an engagement announcement. The important thing to remember about these is the engagement announcement and a marriage license application announcement isn't really proof that the marriage took place. It's just that a license was taken out or a couple got engaged. That's the marriage announcement itself that talks about the marriage occurring that is really great proof of marriage and can kind of be a substitute or fill-in for that important vital record. Again, going to be scattered throughout the newspaper in all different locations, just like birth announcements, often in the local social columns. And here, let's take a look at a couple of examples of early ones. Here's a clip from that first newspaper clip I showed you at the beginning of our program. This is from the Monty Observer, January 1st, 1890. And in that local news column, we had this little bit of information that a couple was married at Otsego, Mission, Michigan, Christmas morning. Thomas Flagstead, age 21, to Olive C. Taylor, age 16. The observer extends congratulations. So there we have good information. We've got the both bride and groom's names, which is very helpful. We have ages, which would help us extrapolate back to figure out a birth date. And what's interesting is, because this is in the Montague paper, assumingly one of these people have a relationship in Montague. Perhaps they grew up there or they're going to live there now. There gives us two places to look for any actual marriage vital records, like a license or an application for a license, either Muskegon County or Allegan County, where Otsego is. So that's another possibility. And, of course, this information gets put in the local news because, like as I mentioned, they probably have a connection to Montague. Another example of an early one that gives us a great clue, this is a May 1899 Chronicle marriage license announcement. A marriage license was yesterday issued to Andrew Backman, age 29, and Annie Bew, age 26, both of Muskegon. So with this date of the Chronicle, you could go forward and look for a, the actual announcement of the marriage, or with the full names and everything, you could look for a marriage certificate in county records to see that the marriage actually occurred. But it's really nice information to find that early in the Chronicle. Now here's a great sample 
of a marriage announcement. And I kind of throw this in with a little hesitation because this isn't what you normally find in the late 19th century, early 20th century, but this is an incredible, extensive marriage announcement from the Muskegon Chronicle from September 1902. And not only do we get the names of the bride and groom, the date and the location, and the musicians and the officiant, and where they're going to be living now that they're married. And then we get a little bit of biographical background on the groom, and then the same thing for the bride, and then a list of guests who attended the wedding. Now, this is quite the marriage announcement for this early time frame, just at the beginning of the 20th century, 1902. And it may be that the Sunderland and Norris families were maybe some prominent families in the Muskegon area or something, or that the information was provided by the family to the paper, and the paper had room and ran it all. You just never know why. But this is a great find, a really lucky find in the early 1900s from the Muskegon Chronicle. Now, in the mid-20th century, they start marriage announcements start being much more common, and they start being a little bit more descriptive, getting a lot more detail about the event itself, maybe what the bridal party is wearing, what the dress looked like. Gives you a little bit more insight into the character or maybe even the physical appearance of some of your early family ancestors. Again, they're still going to be scattered throughout the paper in this time frame. Again, could be if there is like a woman's page or something like that being set aside, could be there, but they also could be just anyplace else in the paper. And those women's pages really become more common about the 1940s when you start seeing that grouping of, of information all in one place. <clears throat> Marriage license lists often now are going to be starting to be supplied by the county clerk. We saw that early one previously, but now in this time frame in the 20th century, they're a little bit more common for the clerk to run those announcements. Again, remember, a marriage license list or an engagement announcement is not proof of the marriage, but still it's a great starting point to find out information. So let's take a look at a few more examples of marriage announcements in the 20th century. Here's a list of applications for marriage licenses that was published in the May 19th, 1928 edition of the Chronicle. And so we get each party's name and age. And if it says city, that means they live in the city of Muskegon. Otherwise, they'll list they live in Montague. This couple lived in Muskegon Heights, so they give you different information there. But this is a nice list. It's a great starting point. We get both the bride and groom's names. We have a rough idea of a date, so we can start extrapolating out from here and looking for a marriage announcement in the paper or looking for the actual marriage license or marriage certificate in county records using the fact that it was published in, 19, in May of 1928. Here's another interesting example. Here's a marriage announcement from August 1st, 1944, Muskegon Chronicle. Of course, 44, we're right in the middle of the war years. We get some nice pictures, though, so that's kind of fun. And we get individuals' names. And this announcement on the left, we get the fact that their marriage date was July 18th. On the right, we don't get a marriage date, but we do get the names of everybody involved, so we can start looking for some information. But it's kind of fun to see those photographs and see those family members at this important event in their life. Then, if we jump ahead to 1961, we start seeing a little bit more detail about the weddings. The social pages, the society pages in the paper are getting a little bit bigger because it real, they're realizing, the newspapers are realizing there's a big audience for this information. And as you can see, the articles are quite lengthy, and we get beautiful photographs of the brides in their gowns, and we get a lot of description of the event themselves and the wedding party and the decorations and the music and that type of thing. Really great, fun information to help you fill in the gaps and enhance the information you do have about family weddings. And then in 1988, they're still kind of doing that style. You can see, the, obviously, the wedding fashion style is changing, but the same good information is there with both names of the parties, a little bit of biographical information, maybe their education and their employment and that type of thing. So very good information to help continue your family history research and fill in gaps where you might not have actual marriage license or marriage certificates for these events. Now, another interesting thing to look for when you're looking at marriage announcements is wedding anniversary announcements. They can also be a great resource for doing family history research and filling in gaps. Let's, take an ex let's look at an example from one from the Muskegon Chronicle on August 1st, 1944. And they're usually for milestone events. And this one is for, obviously, a milestone anniversary. And this one is for 55 years. Usually start seeing, you can see them for 25 years, for 50 years. Usually the big milestone anniversaries. 
but we hear that the Van Dykes celebrated 55 years of marriage on August 1st, so we can extrapolate back. This is from 1944, so we can extrapolate back when they got married. We find out that Mr. Van Dyke was born in the Netherlands, and Mrs. Van Dyke was also born in the Netherlands, and we have birth years, so that's very helpful. We know we won't be looking for U.S. birth records, but we will be looking for European birth records, and then we get names of children and everything. So just fabulous information being provided in these wedding anniversary announcements, too, so we don't want to miss those. Now let's move on to obituaries. Now, obituaries are probably the most commonly searched newspaper item for family history purposes. And they can provide a great deal of information, but again, it just really varies depending on the time frame once more. So we get very brief information in the early years of newspapers. Primarily only prominent members or maybe a pioneer resident of a community would have a lengthy obituary in the paper, and everything else just might be brief information or if it was a notorious death, like a result of an accident or a crime or something or something like that, would be a reason to have a longer news story. And as we said, they can appear anywhere in the paper, just like anything else. So again, you'll have to look, if you're looking at microfilm, even, or even digitized newspapers, if you're not getting any good text searching matches, you're going to have to look at every page of the paper to look for this information. They won't necessarily have a headline. They're obviously, again, simply in those local news social columns or just off on a little bit of information by themselves wherever the newspaper had room in these early papers. Let's take a look at one example. Here's a listing from the Muskegon Chronicle on January 30th, 1869. And this happens to be the earliest Muskegon Chronicle that we have saved on microfilm or in any other format. And we have two listings of deaths here. We have one for a Gracie Mears Avery, who's the only daughter of a family of W.O. and Hattie Avery. And it looks like she died in Washington, D.C., and she was four months and 24 days. So that's very sad. But we get her name, her full name. We get her parents' names. And we get a date of death, which is really great information to follow up doing some more research on Gracie's birth and Gracie's death. The next listing is for an individual, Mr. George Thompson, who died in this city, meaning Muskegon, because it's published in the Muskegon Chronicle, the 25th instance, so January 25th, died of consumption. But he's from Detroit, but he happened to be in the city. So that's kind of an interesting situation there where we get a, pa a listing for his death, even though Muskegon wasn't necessarily his residence. So very interesting to see what kind of information you get there. Another one that comes up, here's a one obituary from the Chronicle from May 7th, 1889. So we're about 20 years later now, and we're getting a little bit more detail. And we can see there's three different listings here. We do have a little headline that says died. Sometimes you see that, sometimes you don't. We have a mother of the age of 41 who died, who apparently has been ill, came to stay with her sister, had lost her husband previously. And she has five children, of whom the care of which is going to fall on her oldest child back at the Dakota homestead. And he's only 19. So this is a fascinating little glimpse into the Chambers family who may be tracking what happened to this father and mother and what happened to these five kids that were left behind. Very interesting uh, little glimpse of family history there. Then we have a listing for another young woman, Mrs. Leroy, who aged 32. Get some f we get some funeral information. That's about it. And then another infant passing. We get the father's name and another some more funeral information. So kind of brief in some cases, a little bit more newsy for the um, young mother. And that gives us all good starting points to move forward to look for birth certificate for the infant, as well as death certificates for all these individuals if we didn't have them already, or this would back up what we would have if there weren't any death certificates that we had located yet. Nice fill-in substitute. <clears throat> as we move into the 20th century, the biographical obituary becomes a little bit more common. It may include information like birth dates and locations, marriage date and location, and even children's and grandchildren's names of the deceased. And it's really likely that the smaller town newspapers are likely to have more space to report on deaths. Larger big city metropolitan newspapers like New York or Boston or Chicago, they might only include newsy obituaries 
with more information for prominent citizens whose families who could pay, afford to pay for the space. Let's look at a couple examples of these more detailed obituaries. Here's a nice sample from the Muskegon Chronicle from September 10th, 1902. And we have one for a Mr. Ryan who died, unfortunately, very young. You will see this as you look at historical newspapers. You will see often the age of death is quite young. And we get information about him. We find out that he was actually born in Tipperary, Ireland. So that's a great little clue to know if we're looking for a birth record for William Ryan. He, we're not going to look in the US. We're going to be looking at United Kingdom records. And talks about the family he leaves behind as well as family in Ireland and a brother in Chicago. So really great little genealogical clues in that obituary. And then our next obituary is one from 1913. Oh, excuse me. We also have Mr. Long here from 1902. And here, here he is. He's the pioneer farmer of Muskegon Township. Pioneer residents will often get nice obituaries in the paper as the, as the local community likes to show their respect for early settlers of the area. And we get lots of good information on Mr. Long, including the fact that he was born at Berlin, Germany, and when he was 22 years old, came to America to make his home. So gives us some great uh, things to start searching for back there. We get children's names and spouse's name and that type of thing. So really good information. Oh, we also get information from Mr. Long that he was a charter member of the Phil Kearney Post, number seven of the GAR. And that's the Grand Army of the Republic, and that was sort of the... Um, VFW Association of its day for those people who served in the Civil War. And actually, a little bit earlier here, it does mention that he served in the Union Army and saw hard service and came out of it with a good record. So that would give us a point of interest that we should look for some military records for Mr. Long if this was a family member we were searching. So some great information in some really early 20th century, 1902 obituaries. Now here's an example of a sort of sad death that took place in 1913, and a suicide. And this is the kind of notorious death, as I mentioned, that the papers might do a little bit longer story. This is an individual named Mr. William Law who committed suicide by drowning at Lake Harbor with the Norton Shores area. And we get a description in this article of the events of the death and how it occurred, and then down here at the, in the end of the story, we get some biographical information about Mr. Law that would let us know that we should look for some birth records in Germany and also some funeral information here. So this is a situation where a little bit more unusual type of death, and so the, story, the paper does a much more detailed story. Now, starting in the 1920s, we start seeing some paid notices. Newspapers start providing an organized classified advertising section that often had space for paid death notices or obituaries. <clears throat> and here's an example in the Muskegon Chronicle. This is from January 1929. Up here we see the rates for having running a notice in the classified ads. It looks like it's about 14 cents if you charge it or 12 cents if you pay cash for six days a little bit more for shorter runs. So obviously, the good deal was paying for at least six days in the paper, and paying cash got you the better deal. And you can see there's legal notices over here. They just have kind of a personal word of comfort statement here. But then we see a little list that says clearly obituary. And we have some individuals' names, and we get a name, the name of the deceased. But this is primarily burial information, not a great deal of biographical information in these brief obituary notices. So just an example where there's some information there in that paid columns, but it, it can be relatively brief. Now, what you don't want to miss is sometimes, even though somebody paid, a family paid to have information in the paid classified section, there may still be a biographical obituary throughout the paper. And here's a, a great example of that. This is a, a listing in the classified ads under obituaries and funeral notices from the Chronicle from actually 1961. And we see there's here a Mr. Theodore Antonopoulos, Frank Harrington, a Mrs. Elnara Taylor. They have their paid notices here, and it's really pretty brief. We get their age, the fact that they passed away, and then some funeral information. When you find this, this it's important to make note of it, but you don't want to skip looking for a regular biographical obituary still in the newspaper, because there still may be one if the family submitted it and the paper could run it. And here's a follow-up for those two individuals that were listed in the classified ads for uh, obituaries. Here's for Mrs. Elnara Taylor, a nice newsy obituary about her life, where she was born, 
married and children surviving. And then, of course, Mr. Anthonopoulos also has information here about some grandchildren who were pallbearers. So even though the information here is very brief, but you get the funeral information, don't, don't forget to still look throughout the paper for some newsy obituaries because they could show up anywhere. And starting around after World War II or so, uh, we start seeing newspapers getting a little more organized and actually grouping information together, like we talked about those uh, society pages, and then they often have a table of contents on the front page of the paper that shows you where things are. And here's from the August 4th, excuse me, August 1st, 1944, Muskegon Chronicle, table of contents, classified ads are on pages 9, 10, 11, the comics are on page 8, editorials are on page 6, as we go down, obituaries are on page 10. So that means that's probably where the paid obituaries are, so you definitely want to look there, but you're still going to want to look throughout the paper to see where else there might be a little bit more lengthy, more biographically oriented obituary for an individual. But it's helpful to see where the newspaper's arranging it when they start adding these table of contents. So that's obituary searching. Now let's take a look at those local news and social columns that we've been talking about briefly with the other types of news items we've been looking for. They're kind of the early version of social media. Americas in past centuries were just as interested in sharing the same tidbits about their everyday life, such as vacations and guests and birthdays and illnesses and business ventures and funny things children do, they were all reported in the social and local news columns instead of on, say, Facebook, because that's what was the media outlet at the time. These little social news columns and local news columns were a, were a staple of American newspapers from small and mid-sized towns for nearly a century, starting around the 1880s. These social columns were an important way residents of a town stayed connected with each other. People could look for news about people they knew and stay updated, and the newspapers definitely catered, catered to that in curiosity. Sometimes the columns are labeled local happenings, society notes, brevities, personal news, it just varies all over the place. And they really, starting about the 1880s and going for almost the 1980s, they were just a staple of small and mid-sized newspapers that were published. Some, they, like I said, they could, they could talk about just everyday happenings, or they also might mention an important life event, such as a birth, marriage, or death, that family researchers are interested in. But we're also interested in those everyday happenings, and that's why these social and local news columns are just so interesting to look at. And some newspapers gathered the content with their staff, or the others just relied on the local residents to, to turn in the information themselves. And it's just amazing what you can find out by going through these columns. Let's take a look. Here's an example of local events from the Muskegon Chronicle, Thursday, May 2nd, 1889. And it looks like they had a snowstorm in May, so we get that little piece of news. We learned that Professor Grundler has been visiting in Holton and on Wednesday pulled out 31 nice brook trout, so he's fishing. And another fisherman, John Munson, caught 28 speckled trout. And the Seventh Ward Ladies Benevolent Society will meet with Mrs. Mosier at her house, 461 Washington Avenue, tomorrow afternoon. And W.R. Skeels passed through the city yesterday on his way to the Upper Peninsula, where he goes to look after some business matters, just finding out little bits and pieces of information of uh, people in your community. And you might just come across and read something about somebody you know. Here's another example of a local events column from the Chronicle from September 12th, 1902. Here we find out that Mrs. Flood of Hart was yesterday and today the guest of Mrs. Smith on Terra Street in Muskegon. And Miss May Barney left this morning to go to Boston where she's gonna stay with Mrs. Davis for a while. And down here, Mrs. May McCracken is going to go to St. Louis, Missouri, and then on to Phoenix for the winter. Just all kinds of great little personal information to s about individuals. And it could be your family member, and you could find out something really unique about them. Another example of some local news and social columns, this time divided up by the local small communities they're covering. So we have Era News and Whitehall News, Pentwater and White River. And this was often the case. These communities, these little towns may have had their own little pu newspaper publishing at the time, but the Muskegon Chronicle would also start gathering up this information because they knew that the people in Muskegon 
City of Muskegon might know people in these communities and be interested in what was happening there as well. Everybody wanted to know what was going on. And here's another final example of a local news column, and this is from the Chronicle from 1913, and titled Society Doings. And we find out about some bridge parties and entertaining friends, but over here, there's another 50th anniversary announcement. So here's a 50th anniversary announcement tucked into a social news column. And you get some great information there. We find out when they were married and where they were married and the names of their children. So just great clues for furthering your genealogical research and tracking down some vital records for marriages and births and things like that. Now, these columns, like I said, started around the 1880s and in the towns of the newspapers for the towns the size of Muskegon. And they started disappearing right around the 1980s, about 100 years later. We don't really see those types of columns anymore. Finally, the last thing we're going to take a look at are commercial advertisements. Now, this might seem kind of unusual. Why would we want to look at advertisements? But reading the classifieds can really make for a fascinating social history study of your ancestors' place and time. An additional benefit of historical news advertisements as they can also provide a name and location for a family business if you weren't aware that it existed. So let's take a look at some examples of that. Here we have a newspaper ad from the Muskegon Chronicle. And we have the fact that Mrs. Cheever is starting her dressmaking business. This is from the October 4th, 1871 Chronicle. So if this is Mrs. Cheever was a family member you were searching, we find out that she had a dressmaking business that was over the Davis store on Western Avenue. And she also did millinery and fancy goods. Probably means she worked on hats and gloves and things like that as well. Over here, we have an interesting advertisement for 900,000 acres of farming and pine lands for sale, lands that the Grand Rapids and Indian Railroad Company own and now bringing to market in Kent County, Montcalm, Wexford, Manistee, Wasaki, Clare. If you had a family member who got a large amount of land, maybe started a farm in this time frame in 1870s, this might have been the sale that uh, they saw and decided to make that big purchase. Here's another example of some advertisements from the Chronicle in September 12, 1902. Here we learn that Mrs. Clara Waters Baldwin, she's formerly of New York, and she's teaching piano. So if this individual was a family member you were searching for, we know that we, she used to live in New York, and now she's in Muskegon, and she's teaching piano to people. The Baker bookstore was the big school supply store that people might be interested in. The Lawson family had uh, obviously had some type of photography studio. What's also kind of fun about looking at advertisements, we get the prices here. We can see that making blankets are coming in about two fifty or three twenty five a piece, and they're really big, seventy inches by eighty four inches. And down here we can see beds are for sale, three dollars for all iron beds. They were normally three dollars, now they're a dollar sixty five. It's just kind of fun to see those difference in prices in nineteen oh two. Here's another ad from the Chronicle from 1928. We happen to see there happened to be a steamship travel to Chicago from Grand Haven twice a day in 1928. They left at 10, 7.30 and 10.30 in the evening. And that maybe you had family members who took that route and traveled to Chicago that way instead of by the train. And over here with this Eureka ad, we start to see we're now in 1928. We're starting to see you know some modern conveniences come into life. It's kind of fun to see how they would advertise that and then the pricing and everything. Just kind of a fun little glimpse of a snapshot in time and what your family member was probably experiencing in that time in 1928. And finally, one last ad that I've had here is just for a grocery store. And this is, this is an ad from the um, Lexington Herald, and that's Lexington, Kentucky. And uh, this ad is a, I, one I'd like to include because it's actually an a ad for my family. The Jay Grocery Company was my grandparents' grocery store on Loudon Avenue in Lexington. And it's just kind of fun to see their sales flyer for Friday and Saturday. The year of this is 1937. I don't have, this is a, a clipping that's been passed down through the family, so I don't have an exact date on it, but 1937, Lexington Herald. And it's fun to see the prices, 10 pounds of sugar, 55 cents, five, six Coca-Colas plus tax for 25 cents. Uh, three boxes of post toasty cereal, 25 cents. Just kind of fun to see those ads. And also note to see to know that this store was run by my grandparents. And it means a lot in our family because this is the, the family story is 
Um, my mother, who was going to the University of Kentucky, was staying with her sister then, who lived in Lexington and a couple streets over from Loudoun Avenue. And of course, my dad was also at the University of Kentucky in 1937, and he would work at the store part time. And they, my mother and my aunt used this store all the time to run over to get staples for the house, and that's how they met. So this is another reason why this ad gives me a snapshot in time for my family in Lexington and Kentucky, and plus it has a really personal significance because it is a family business. Now that we've looked at various types of information available to family history researchers in newspapers, let's now talk more about how to actually search these historical newspapers. So researching in nice microfilmed newspapers. To bring back a reminder from the start of the session, it's important to remember that not everything is digitized. We will talk about some digitized newspaper collections that are available to you next, but first we're going to discuss microfilm. Nobody really wants to use microfilm, but sometimes it's the only choice. The majority of newspapers that only have online content or digitized content starts in the 1990s or even the 2000s. And often, many online news sources only archive the text of their articles without the photographs or without the advertisements, including obituaries that are, that are paid ones. So to fill those gaps, libraries still uh, have microfilm editions of their newspapers. So first of all, when getting ready to research in microfilm, first of all, you need to find a paper to search. You're going to want to consider where the family member lived that you're interested in searching. You may have this information of residency from a personal family story or a census record or an original vital birth, death, or marriage record. And then you're going to want to start looking for the local newspaper for that event or maybe the bigger city newspaper nearby if the local community didn't have a newspaper. One quick tip for doing this is to uh, do a quick Google search for the name of the community in the public library. For example, if someone was interested in Muskegon, they could just uh, Google you know, Muskegon County, Michigan Public Library and see what comes up. And then uh, you get some contact information for a public library or historical society in the area. You can also search for a historical society as a search term. And then either next you could look for a website for that local public library or historical society or some contact information like a phone number or an email and contact the organization to find out what they have on newspaper holdings on microfilm. Just so you know, this is a really common question that public libraries and historical societies get all the time. So it's not strange to call us out of the blue and say, hey, do you have... Uh, historical newspapers for your community and wh what kind of format are they in and how can I have access to them, those types of things. So don't feel odd about making that phone call. And just so you know, for example, here at the Norton Shores branch of the Muskegon Area District Library, the Muskegon Chronicle is available on microfilm from January 30th, 1869 to December 31st, 2018. That's the newspaper start being filmed in 2019. Almost all newspapers Start being microfilm stopped being used in 2019 because it stopped being created. They weren't manufacturing. They aren't manufacturing microfilm anymore. Now there are, of course, other on online resource options to find out where newspaper collections may be located, and we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail when we go online shortly. Now, if you've located a, a microfilm for a local newspaper that you're interested in searching, but it happens to be a distance away from you, you can have a couple of options. One, ask the library or the historical society if they have any kind of research service. Many libraries and historical societies do offer a newspaper lookup service. It might be free or it might have a charge. It just depends by every organization. But they might have an option where they would do some newspaper searching for you, uh, depending on how much information you have. For example, the Muskegon Area District Library does offer a free newspaper search off, the, off option if uh, the researcher has an exact date that they're interested in and the individual's name and the location of the event. And, uh, but if anybody has anything that they're not sure, like it could take place in a whole year or something like that, that's a little bit beyond the service that our library can offer. But different organizations may offer a more in-depth research service, but it might be fee-based or something like that. So that's an option for you if, if, the, if the newspaper on microfilm is far away. Another option is to ask uh, the local library or historical society holding the newspaper if there's any kind of indexes that available 
and maybe a, a print one. It might be a local in-house online index. It just depends. Lots of libraries that can hold, held uh, historical newspapers created indexes over the years. So it's always good to ask about that if there's any way to search real quickly. For example, the Muskegon County Genealogical Society does have some vital records indexes for the Chronicle going back a significant amount of years, and they have a set of those available on their website that you can see the information there, and they have even more available in print form, and you can find those uh, in, at Hackley Library's Local History and Genealogy Department. And then finally, for uh, a public library or historical society repository that's far away, ask about interlibrary loaning of the microfilm. Some do, some, some institutions do, some don't. For example, the Muskegon Area District Library, we do not loan our microfilm, but some locations do, so it always doesn't hurt to ask. And also, you're, if you think, well, so what if I can get the microfilm on a loan? How am I going to look at it? Uh, your local library may allow you to bring it in and use their microfilm reader if they have one. For example, here at the Norton Shores branch of the Muskegon Area District Library, we do have a microfilm reader, printer, scanner, and we do allow people to bring in their own microfilm to look on it, or a microfilm that they've interlibrary loaned through another institution, um, like a family history library from the Church of the Latter-day Saints. If they borrowed a film through there or something, then they are, we do allow them to bring it in and use our equipment to look at it. So that's always an option for you as well. If you find out that you're, if you're researching family in your own hometown and you find out uh, where the, your local hometown newspaper is archived, so maybe it's at your local public library or um, historical society. Then you're going to want to find out how does you go about getting a chance to look at the microfilm. Are there certain hours that the microfilm is available? Or can you just drop in to look at it? Or do you need an appointment? Details like that you'll want to ask the, the library or historical society. And then also ask about when I come to look at it, how can I save news items? Can I print it from your microfilm reader? Or is scanning available? What are my options there? For example, here at the Norton Shores branch, our microfilm reader printer scanner does allow you to both print an image from the microfilm on paper or uh, scan an image, either a JPEG photo file or a PDF document of an image and save it to a USB drive or um, save it to the desktop and then email it to yourself. There's a variety of options there. So that's always something to find out when you're going to be accessing the microfilm yourself. So once you've located the microfilm and you're on a machine and you're getting a chance to look at it, what you're going to want to remember next is to plan on spending some time with this microfilm. With microfilm, there is no way to search by text, no way to type in a name into a search box or anything to look for something. Microfilm is just what it sounds like. It's just photographed images, film images of the actual newspaper page by page. So if you were lucky enough that you have uh, a locally produced uh, index that gives you information for that a citation, then you can go directly to that in that date and page number on the newspaper microfilm. You'll have to advance the newspaper microfilm in chronological order until you find it, but uh, usually there's like a month uh, and uh, one month of a year on a roll of film, and you can go right to that citation that you have, and that's incredibly time-saving. Now, if there is no indexing option or any way that you, prov you located a citation, then some good Step to remember is start with the newspaper issue that is closest to the date of the event that you're looking for. For example, if it's a death date, don't start with the next day. If the newspaper happens to be an afternoon paper, for example, it might actually have something about that death event on the actual day of the death. So you'll want to start with the exact date of the death. And then a good rule of thumb for obituaries is to search at least seven to 10 days out. So if you're not finding something in your first couple of dates, keep going. So at least a week to 10 days out and see if you come across everything. And for other things like announcements for births or weddings, it's really hard to say. I've seen wedding announcements be as far as three months out. So it's just a matter of how much time and dedication you want to put into finding it. But always start with the date of the event and then go out beyond there. Now, you'll need to look at every page of the newspaper. So this isn't going to go by really fast. As we saw earlier, an obituary, a marriage announcement, a birth announcement, it could literally be anywhere in the paper. 
Now, if there is a table of contents, make sure you check the pages that they provide for obituaries, but you don't want to rely on it. You're going to want to look at every page of the paper, just like you were reading a piece of newspaper in your hands. And finally, don't skip those local social news columns. We saw how important those were. Be sure and read through those as well. You may come across the event that you're looking for, or you might even get really lucky and find an unrelated mention about that particular relative or another family member who was living in the area at the same time. And that's always just kind of an extra lucky gold find, gold mine find to find a, another mention of a family member or something when you were looking for something entirely different. But going through those local news and social columns takes a little bit of time, but it is totally, totally worth it. So that's some tips and tricks for looking at microfilmed newspapers. Now let's take a look at what our digitized newspaper options are. Interestingly enough, the big genealogy mega sites that the Muskegon Area District Library subscribes to for our patrons and the sites that we often discuss in our other Root Talk sessions, both Ancestry Library Edition and the My Heritage Library Edition, they actually don't have digitized historical newspapers, either part of their library subscription offering or it's duplicate uh, images of digitized newspapers that can be found elsewhere. So it's kind of interesting. This is one of the few root talks where we're not really going to rely on Ancestry Library Edition or My Heritage Library Edition to do our research. So we're going to look, just look at a couple screenshots of what these two mega sites can offer us for uh, genealogy newspaper research. We'll start with Ancestry Library Edition. Ancestry Library Edition provides access to the US Newspaper Obituary Index for their newspaper.com database. Now that newspaper.com database does have digitized newspaper images, but they don't make those images available through the Library Edition subscription. So you can certainly, they do make available a newspaper.com obituary index that you can search, and that can be very helpful if you get a match. But you're not going to see the entire obituary without an additional paid subscription to newspapers.com, and newspapers.com is not a subscription that Mattel currently offers. But let's take a look at an example of how you can use the obituary index even though you don't have access to newspapers.com. So here's the search page for the newspaper index. And here I'm looking for, I've decided to look for a possible obituary for my great grandmother. So I know her first name is Sarah. I know her last name is Durbin. And I know she died in the 50s, but I don't have an exact date. So I put in 1955 and then chose the option of plus or minus five years in either direction. And then I uh, put in, I know she died in Lexington, Kentucky, and that's in Fayette County, Kentucky. So that's the information I put in. And then I hit the search button, and we go from there. Up comes a list of search results with the best matches ranked first. And it turns out that, yes, the very first listing here looks very promising. It lists uh, an individual by the name of Sarah Lincoln Durbin, and I do know her middle name was Lincoln. And it doesn't give me a birth date, but it gives a publication date of the obituary, and that's what this is, a publication date of September 11th, 1951, and a place of Lexington, Kentucky. So that looks uh, promising to be the uh, individual's obituary that I'm looking for. So I'm going to click on View Record, and then we'll take a look at the next screenshot. And this is the information that you will get from Ancestry Library Edition when you search the newspapers.com obituary index that they provide. So we get some very helpful information here. I get Sarah Lincoln Durbin's full name. I get her gender. I get the address uh, is Loudon Avenue. And there we go, Loudon Avenue. If you remember, that's where the grocery store was. I know that's the right location. Death about 50, 1951. And the obituary date is September 11th, 1951. So hopefully the date of the obituary might say that she died the day before or something like that. So I could narrow that down to a more exact date. And the obituary place is Lexington, Kentucky, and her parents in the obituary are listed as John Akers and Armina Gray Akers. So I know this is the right person because all those people match up. So this is some very helpful information for me. And now uh, the one really great thing that Ancestry's index, obituary index provides you is if you go down a little bit further on the page, here's the source citation. And this obituary is in the Lexington Herald, uh, September 11, 1951 issue. So now I know I need to look for a 
where Lexington Herald newspapers might be available to me, either digitized or on microfilm. So that's a great starting point to figure out where I need to go. But that's as far as I can go in Ancestry Library Edition, because the actual newspapers themselves, even though uh, the source citation here provides a, a link to the digital image, I won't be able to access it from the Muskegon Area District Library subscription to Ancestry Library Edition because we do not have the extra additional fee-based subscription for newspapers.com. Now, I can tell you in our West Michigan shoreline area, uh, the complete newspaper.com subscription from Ancestry is available for people to use at the Laudit Library in Grand Haven. Uh, you have to go into the library to use it. However, only Laudit Library cardholders can access newspapers.com from home. But you are welcome to go into the library and use it. And again, I recommend checking the Laudit Library website, seeing what their hours are uh, currently and when you can get in and take a look at that. Now, right now, uh, neither Hackley nor the Muskegon Area District Library sub currently subscribes to newspapers.com, just the regular Ancestry Library Edition. Uh, database. So that's what the Ancestry Library Edition provides us. Let's take a look at the next mega genealogy site, my Heritage Library Edition, and what they can offer us. Now, this is a my Heritage Library Edition is the fee-based genealogy website that Madel makes available to everyone through the Michigan eLibrary. And it's, interestingly enough, it does have a nice newspaper collection but dig that are digitized, but the bulk of the papers, just about everything they have, comes from the Library of Congress's Chronicling America 1836 to 1922 project. Now, this is actually a digital collection that's free to access on the Library of Congress site. You can certainly uh, search and look through the uh, Historic American newspapers in this time frame using the search interface here on MyHeritage, but I want to point out that if you didn't have access, if you were in a library that didn't subscribe to MyHeritage Library Edition, if you were a cardholder there, or you didn't have your own personal subscription to MyHeritage, you can still access this exact same collection of newspapers via the Library of Congress for free. So we're going to take a look at that Library of Congress page uh, online shortly, but I just wanted you to see this is what the search page looks like uh, for MyHeritage Library Edition if you wanted to search the digitized newspapers from Chronicling America via their site. Now let's take a look at a couple other subscription-based newspaper options. Probably the most well-known subscription newspaper site currently is Genealogy Bank. It says, the company says, they are the world's largest obituary collection online, that they have 330 years plus of US newspaper coverage, and 13,000 newspaper titles, and they have titles from all 50 states. Now, I can tell you that Genealogy Bank does include the Muskegon Chronicle digitized from 1869 to 1922. And it's the only resource that currently has the Chronicle digitized for that time frame. However, Genealogy Bank is not a resource that libraries can subscribe to. They make their membership available directly to individuals only. They do offer sort of a library version called America's Genealogy Bank. And while it's similar to the regular Genealogy Bank, it's not quite the same resource. Titles that are added to Genealogy Bank do not go into the library version of America Genealogy Bank. And for example, there are over 3,800 newspaper titles in Genealogy Bank approximately right now. And there's about 2,200 in America's Genealogy Bank that's available to libraries. So it just kind of gives you a sense that if you want to search, search the complete product of Genealogy Bank, you need to use the personal edition. And that would mean getting a subscription uh, if you don't know somebody who has one already. And as far as I'm aware right now, no libraries in our West Michigan shoreline area subscribe to America's Genealogy Bank. The next digitized subscription resource for newspapers that we're going to look at is the Newsbank Muskegon Chronicle Collection. This is available for you through the Muskegon Area District Library's website at www.madl.org. And you can also access it from home with your yellow Madl card. And it provides you access to both full text and digitized versions of the Muskegon Chronicle from 1997 to current. 
digitized images of the actual paper in full color, so you're like looking at the paper, are available on this website only from 2018 to current. But it does mean that you can look at the current paper all the time on the website, the current daily issue of the Chronicle. They also provide, from 1997 to current, a full text version of the Chronicle, which means they have full text uh, typed transcriptions of the content that was in the paper. But again, that means they don't have any advertisements, and they don't have any photographs, and they don't have any paid advertisements, which does often include obituary, which means no obituaries in the full text version. When you look at the digitized image from 2018 not current, there are obituaries, but the full text version from 1997 to current day is, does not include obituaries. But they also offer the full text of the web version of the Chronicle, which sort of the M Live version of the Chronicle, which can be different. The content can be different from the print version of the paper. And that's available on this, through this database, NewsBank, uh, from 2012 to current. Again, as I mentioned, you can access it either at ho in a Muskegon Area District Library branch using the public computers or at home using your library card. And we'll take a closer look at NewsBank when we go online in a moment. Next, I want to talk about some free sites for digitized newspapers. It's very exciting. Two free sites that are extremely helpful in searching digitized newspapers include the uh, National Endowment for the Humanities US Newspaper Program, and what we already mentioned, the Library of Congress's Chronicling America Project. And we're going to go online now and take a look at both of these websites and just see what's available to you in terms of actually digitized newspapers or links to digitized newspapers that may be very valuable in your family history research. Here we are on the website for the National Endowment for the Humanities U.S. Newspaper Program. The United States Newspaper Program, otherwise known as USNP, is a massive project to inventory the newspaper holdings in a given state that are housed in public libraries or county courthouses, newspaper offices, college and university libraries, archives, and historical societies. The really great part about this newspaper program is the site also provides a link to the digitized newspapers for each state. So it is a great starting point to find out quickly what's available digitally for every state. Here on the home page, the states are listed alphabetically a little bit farther down. As we scroll down the page, we get a little description of the project. And then we start seeing the states listed alphabetically by name. And we're going to scroll all the way down until we get to Michigan and see what's available there. So here under Michigan, we have two partners in the project. The first is the Library of Michigan here. and They're a part in the project. But as we look a little bit closer, the Clark Historical Library at Central Michigan University provides the digital newspaper portal for Michigan. So this is the site that we're interested in. So we're going to click on this link. We're going to get a warning from the NAH site that we're leaving the site, just so we know that. We say OK. And then up comes the website for the Clark Historical Library on the Central Michigan University webpage. We get a little description about the newspaper portal and what they do. And then we have a nice county map over here so we can see where the counties are. And then we get a list of the counties alphabetically by name and what papers are available where. So let's scroll down here to Muskegon County. And here we see the Montague Observer is listed twice, the Chronicle, a couple, another Observer listing, and then some other White Lake area papers. That's what seems to be available digitally for Muskegon County. But let's look at Muskegon Chronicle. It's interesting. It says pay. Let's see what it tells us. We click on the Chronicle link. And up comes the page for the Muskegon Chronicle for Genealogy Bank. Remember, we talked about Genealogy Bank just a short while ago, which was a fee-based newspaper subscription option available to individuals, not available to libraries. And the library version doesn't carry everything that the full Genealogy Bank individual version carries. But here we see that the uh, Muskegon Chronicle is digitized from 1869 to 1922. So, Good to know, but Genealogy Bank isn't what we're interested in right now because we don't have a subscription. So we're going to close out that link and go back. And let's see. I wonder why the Montague Observer is listed twice. Let's look at the first link. And that brings us up to the Montague Museum Historical Association homepage. And it says here, no longer active. 
search the newspaper archives in White Lake Community Library. So at one point in time, the digital image, images were on this page, but they're giving us a nice notice that they're no longer active. So we're going to close out that tab and go back. And that's why there's two listings for the Montague Observer. So we'll check the second listing. And look, it takes us to the White Lake Community Library website, where we can search all of these one, two, three, four, five White Lake, Montague, uh, White Hall area newspapers for family history research, and they'll be digitized. So let's take a look at the Montague Observer and see if we can find that uh, wedding announcement that we talked about at the very beginning of the program in that local news column from the Observer for a Thomas Flagstad and an Olive Taylor. So I'm going to, I'm not going to worry about the date. Let's say I don't remember what the date is, so I'm not going to worry about that. But I'm going to put in what keywords that I know, and I want to find all these words in an article. So I'm going to leave it there. Your options are any of the words, which is going to get you, if, if you use somebody's name, anybody else that has the same either first name or last name, and, and an exact phrase. So an exact phrase is when you only want those two words in that order together. But we're going to try doing all these words. And if I remember, Thomas's name was abbreviated in that little item. So we're going to type in his last name. And then the wife's first name was Olive. And that's kind of unusual, so I'm going to add that. So I've got the Montague Observer selected. I'm, going with, I'm not using any dates now. I'm starting really general. And then putting in what names I remember. And I'm going to search collections. And up we get a link. Here's the Montague Observer. It was in January, so then we just we can just click right on the image. And up comes the image, and highlighted will be where the names come up. And here, look at this is talking about the town of Olivet, and they highlighted Olive because it's looking for her name. And then there's the word those gets highlighted because T-H-O-S is in there. But if I scroll down here and look at this, here it highlighted is Thomas Flagstead, age 21, married at Otsego to Olive Taylor. So here's that link in that digital image, and now I can find it for myself. And I have a couple options over here. I can print it out if I'm at a place where I have a printer. I can uh, download the image and save it to my um, computer that I'm working on, and then either email it to myself or save it on a USB drive or save it on the computer. So that's kind of a nice option. And you can blow the paper up to look at it even bigger. And you can use the minus sign, of course, to take it down and see the whole page. So that's a great feature of uh, an easy access to digital newspapers. So I'm going to close out the tab for that and close out our search tab and go back and see. So here for the whole state of Michigan by county, you can see if something's available free, you should be able to access it then. And if something says pay, then it's probably not going to be available without some kind of fee unless you have access to a library or something. But just a great resource and a great way through the uh, newspaper project to find papers from Michigan. And of course, if we go back to the newspaper program's homepage, uh, not just Michigan, but every state, you can go through and check and see what's available. And every state's website will look a little bit different. Michigan's is kind of easy to use. Some of them are a little harder, but the newspaper website is definitely a site you're going to use in your genealogy research in newspapers. And here we are on the website for the Library of Congress's project, Chronicling America. Chronicling America is a website that provides access to information about historic newspapers and also access to a select collection of digitized newspaper pages. And it's produced by the National Digital Newspaper Program, which is a partnership by, once again, the National Endowment for the Humanities and Library of Congress. It's a huge long-term effort to develop a web-based searchable database of US newspapers for free. The site currently contains, as we see over here, over 17 million pages of digitized newspaper. And uh, it covers the time span right now of 1777 through 1963. Uh, not every state in the US is represented here. And obviously, not every newspaper in the state is represented. But they're adding content all the time. And all the pages of the digital database are searchable by individual words or names of individuals. Right here on the home page is a basic search. You can search all the states. You can choose a state, if you'd like, and then choose a time period and type in a name. Under the advanced search, you can choose a, a, a state again, or you can um, choose a name of a paper. If you happen to know what it is and they happen to have it, you can search that way and then uh, add some, f separate your text words if you want a phrase search to all the words together. Any one of the words that might show up, you want all the words in the same, all the words in the same uh, page, or with words within five or you know 
10 words of each other. Quite a, a wide variety of ways that you can search. Let's go back, home, back to the basic search page, and let's just try doing the state of Michigan. And let's say, I'm going to try searching for, um, for the individual I want to look for. I'm going to say 1892, how about 1905. And then I'm going to just type in a name. Let's search for somebody fairly well known, Charles Hackley. Here's our time frame, our state newspapers, and we're going to hit go and see what we get. And we got 63 results showing the name Charles Hackley. And you can see when you just kind of scan through the images here that the, the words are highlighted in pink, so they're easy to find on the page. I'm just going to start with the first one here. It looks like it came from the True Northerner in February 24th, 1905. So I'm going to click on that. And up comes the page. And over here, looks like something's highlighted in a headline. So I'll go back up to the top and blow up my image a little bit. Pull the paper over here and it says, C.H. Hackley's Will. The Michigan Trust Company in Grand Rapids and Thomas Hume of Muskegon named as co-executors. And here's a big article on Thomas, excuse me, on Charles Hackley's will because he passed away recently. So they're um, talking about the contents of the will. So that's very interesting. And then you have options. You can uh, look at the in the text format, a PDF format, or a photograph format, and then you can save or download the images uh, to the device, the computer that you're working on, and looking at this. So very helpful way to take a look at some digitized newspapers. Let's go back to the home page. Now, a really extremely as helpful aspect of this website is the newspaper directory over here, the US newspaper directory, 1690 to present. Now, what's great about this, it contains a listing of the names of virtually all the newspapers published in the United States since 1690. So, it's not a list of what they have. It's a list of all the newspapers that ever published in the United States since 1690. It's a really great resource to find out what newspapers were publishing when for a community. The online list is searchable by location, time period, and keyword. So let's take a look about that. We'll click on that tab. And we see here at the top of the page, you can search, browse the directory by title. Or you can search, select a state and a county and a city and look for a newspaper that might have been publishing. And this is very helpful. Remember we talked about earlier contacting when you, when you want to start searching, you know your local community and you want to see what's available and you might, look, you might Google search for a public library in the area and ask them. You certainly can do that. And this is just another way to find that information as well. Let's say, remember that uh, advertisement I had for the day grocery company, my family uh, business, and um, I just knew that it was Lexington Herald in 1937 is what is it's actually a clipping, so that's what's on the back of it. So let's say I want to find out if the Herald was publishing that, if that, if that citation's right. So I'm going to go down here and choose the state of Kentucky. I'm going to choose Fayette County because I know that that's the county for Lexington, and see what cities were publishing Lexington was. Uh, this is the whole wide range of newspapers from 1690 to current. But I know the store was operating, oh, let's see, I think it was operating approximately 1920 to 1950. So we'll try that search. And I'm not going to put anything else in here right now. I'm just going to put in a search and see what comes up for papers. So 49 newspapers were publishing in Lexington in that time frame. And the Lexington Herald down here, 1904 to 1983, that's why it's included, because it covers my time frame. The Herald is listed again from 1873 to 19, and then question marks, the range keeps going. So I'm going to take a look at this listing for the Lexington Herald here. And it tells me for the years it's publishing in this time frame, 1904 to 1983, had some different titles. The place of publication was Lexington, and the cover geographic Coverage was for the town of Lexington, publisher, all kinds of information, a basic catalog record for this newspaper. But way down at the bottom is a very helpful holdings list, view complete holdings information. So we can click on that, and we can see all the different places that will have this newspaper in some format. And right here, Kentucky Historical Society Library, Frankfort, Kentucky, they have the time frame I'm looking for. I go a little bit further, the Kentucky Newspaper Project in Lexington, they have it as microfilm for, the, for uh, 
some of the date ranges I'm looking for. So that's really helpful to know. So this is just a great resource to find out um, who has the, um, the record. If you look at the holding record here, you can also, if we go back, and here we're looking at our catalog record, and we went down here and looked at the holdings record. We can also go right here. It says libraries that have it, and it takes us right back into that same holding record. And you can find out who has it, and then get some contact information for those libraries and find out how you might access it. So that is really just a great help to researchers, particularly um, tracking down newspapers that were publishing when. They're not gonna, they may not be digitized on Chronicling America because they're really just getting going, in terms of coverage with all the huge number of newspapers that were published in the United States, but at least you can find out what was publishing when for your community that you're interested in. And now to finish up our online searching for this session of Root Talk, we're just gonna take a really quick look at the Muskegon Chronicle collection in Newsbank that's available to you from the Muskegon Area District Library website. So we'll go to the library website, which is www.madl.org. We're going to scroll down, and over here we're going to choose databases. Click on that. And then when that page comes up, it's a list of all the different databases that are available to you from the library. And if there's a yellow library card in the list of the database, it means you must have a card to access it. If there's a state of Michigan emblem, it means you just need to be a resident of the state of Michigan. If it's got a location emblem, it means you have to be in the library to access it. And if it has kind of a globe emblem, it means there's no restrictions and you can access it um, where, uh, from our website wherever you are. So we're going to scroll through the list here. They're alphabetical by name. And so that means we're going to scroll down to the M's. And here it is, the Muskegon Chronicle, powered by Newsbank. And then we see that uh, the old library card's there. So if you're at home and you want to access this, you're going to have to have your library card handy. But I'm in the library, so I'm going to click on it. And up comes the uh, homepage for the Muskegon Area District Library's Newsbank collection for Muskegon Chronicle. And down here we have a list of the three sources that are available in the subscription. We talked about this briefly earlier. The Muskegon Chronicle from 1997 to current is available in a text format, which means it's all the news articles in the newspaper, but they're typed out like in a, tr in a transcription format. They're not an image of the newspaper. It's not a photograph of the newspaper. That means that no advertisements are going to be in there and no paid uh, advertising of any kind is going to be in there. So that means no paid obituaries are going to be in this content. But you can still search it by name. And then uh, the Muskegon Chronicle here, the next database offering is 2018 to current in full image. This is a full digitization of the newspaper. That means it's going to be a photograph of the newspaper just like it appeared in print. And you will see obituaries in this collection because um, it is just a scanned image of the paper. But it only goes back to 2018. They just started doing that. And then finally, the web edition of the newspaper. Um, if you're familiar with the, looking at the Chronicle online under M Live, sometimes they have stories on the M Live website that don't appear in the print version. So it's going to be a little bit different from uh, the print version of the paper. And from 2012 to current, it's available uh, through text only as well. But again, obituaries probably won't be in there because it's not including any paid content because it's, it's the web edition. So qu very quickly, you can do a really easy keyword search right up here. If you search in this box right here with all three sources listing, it's going to take it's going to search each one of the um, databases and bring up text bring up hits from the text version of the Chronicle, from the digitized version that's only available from 2018 on, or the web version that's available from 2012 on. And so for the sake of privacy, I'm not going to do any obituary, obituary searching right now since these are fairly recent dates, but I am going to take a look at the library. We're just going to search the library's name and see what we get in terms of hits on this database. And I put the name in quotation marks because I want all those words, terms to show up together. And so we're going to hit the search button and see what we get. And we get a list that they're going to be listed by uh, the newest, most newest article first. And they'll go down older. And then like the first article that comes up is the April 16th, April 6th, excuse me, um, article about the fact that we have eliminated overdue fees. And then if you just go down, you can scroll. If you see over here in the box, if it looks like it's typed out, that means it's going to be a text version. And then if you look at 
if it looks like a, it looks like newspaper print or something, that's going to be a digitized version of the paper. So let's go back to the homepage for the Muskegon Chronicle collection. And I just want to show you real quickly what's kind of fun about this as well. Not only is it helpful to look for information in the Chronicle from 1997 on, although really from only 2018 on are obituaries available, uh, but you can read the paper every day, and you might not have realized this. So let's start with the 2018 Muskegon Chronicle in uh, the image format, which is the middle listing. We're going to click on that. And then what comes up is a page for us to select a date that we want to look at. And over here is the calendar year, and then all these dates that are highlighted in blue, any one of them you click on and read the paper. If we just change the year of the calendar up in the box up here, then it'll take a second, and then all these months will come up with the dates highlighted in blue to take a look at the paper. But let's go back to 2021. And the other thing it does is right at the top, it, it puts up the most recent issues that are available. And today is actually April 9th. And so if I click on April 9th, I can click on it up here, or I can go down in the calendar box and click on it here. And that page will pop up. And up comes some digitized images of the Chronicle, looking just like if you were reading the newspaper in print at home. So you can scroll up and down. You can use the plus and minus signs to make the paper bigger to read. And then to go to the next page, this, you can use the arrow here that goes previous and next pages. You can jump to a page by doing that. But if you want to read the paper in order, like if you were reading it in print form, you just pick the next page. And then you can just scroll down the page and read the paper. So this is the paper for the April 9th that you can read. So every day you can read the paper at home with your library card for the Muskegon Chronicle, or uh, if you have a yellow metal card, or you can come into the library and read it there. So that's very quickly, in a nutshell, a look at NewsBank, which is available on Mattel's website and a resource that the Muskegon Area District Library subscribes to for our library users. Thank you for watching this Root Talk session, and I hope this information is helpful. The Muskegon Area District Library serves the community with 10 local branches, and we're open 24-7 with access to many digital resources. Don't forget to like us on our Facebook page and subscribe to our YouTube channel, and please visit us at maddle.org. Thank you. Thank you.